We are here with Maurice Dion, private investigator, retired. And Mo, how'd you get into the business? Well, it started back in 1977 when I decided to change careers. I uh, took some time off and tried to see how I would obtain a license to become an investigator, which is a uh, few steps you have to go through. One is I had to go through the town council. I had to be cleared without having a record. And then once I passed the council and my record was clear, I received a license to become an investigator. That doesn't mean that because you have a license, you know everything. You now have to train and learn how to use all, and do all the techniques. Fortunately, in my case, I started to work for three different agencies or bureaus. And during the time I was working for them, I learned quite a bit from other professionals that had been at it for many, many, many years. And through that, there, were one, there was one agency that decided they wanted me to work for them full time. I gave it a lot of thought to make that determination if I would go and work for him. And I did. He was former military intelligence, and he was very, very knowledgeable on all the different techniques that was being done at the time and being used. So therefore, it was to my advantage to study underneath him. He had numerous books that I could read and study, which I did, and I learned a lot of techniques in all aspects of investigations civil, criminal, and domestic. The ones I did a lot were probably domestics, though I did like the uh, criminal ones much better, and I also enjoyed missing persons. Probably I ended up doing missing persons quite a bit at the end of my career. But with the domestic cases, there was a lot of stuff going on at the time, with uh, divorces, Divorced spouses at that time <clears throat> were having a lot of trouble in court to prove that who was at fault. So it was my job to prove who was going out on who, who was right, who was wrong. There were times it could be a messy uh, situation when we were running into some problems from the person we were following. But you learn after a while how to follow without being spotted. And that is a technique within itself. <clears throat> and I learned that very quickly on how to tail someone and not get spotted by the target itself. Also, another trick we would use is have a change of clothing in the car as well. We would use that technique quite a bit by putting a hat, a hat on or a different colored hat, sunglasses or glasses if you didn't need to wear them. You could put on phony glasses and even change your disguise in the vehicle. The next important thing when you were doing a surveillance job was to, or, or a uh, following an individual is to make sure all your lights on your vehicle were working properly. You didn't have a light bulb that was off or was blinking or was dull. Everything had to be perfect. So when you were following the target, when they looked in the rearview mirror, your vehicle looked perfect. Now, there were some tricks we used to use. There were techniques as turning off one of your lights temporarily with a switch in the car and then turning it on at a later time when you got behind another vehicle to throw the target off so they wouldn't realize it was the same car in the evening. Daytime, you always tried to keep a car between you. 
and I started to develop another technique from doing it so often. I would use two vehicles to follow a subject, which seemed to work a lot better, and I could obtain the information a lot faster. <clears throat> the problem is that you had X amount of hours to work on a case before it got too expensive. So I always tried to keep it within a certain amount of time to solve the case. But that would depend on if the individual, the target, was going out. Now, there was rare that we would follow someone and they were not going out. 95% of the time, I would say, when a client came in my office <clears throat> and they suspected something, there was something there. Another thing that when a client came in and I interviewed them, which would take about an hour, many a times by the time they left my office, I already knew the direction I was going to be going into. Because a lot of time it was someone that the subject knew, that my client also knew. And there's a series of questions that we would ask which we eventually could go into de detail at a later date to determine if a spouse is cheating on another one. Besides doing domestic cases, I also did missing persons. That was a whole different avenue. That was by means of other people that I would use, that I made contacts with throughout my career that had access to different types of records. And I would use them to try to locate different people that were missing or disappeared for whatever reason. But I was usually able to locate them and find them where they were located and give the information out to the uh, client. So there was uh, quite a bit of stuff that was involved as an investigator. It wasn't just a simple thing of sitting behind the desk. There was a lot of work that went in behind it, a lot of paperwork, a lot of research work. And we didn't have all the techniques that they have today, like the internet. We didn't have that in our days. We did it the long way. The old telephone and the old walking down the town hall or whatever it might be, or getting in the vehicle and going to a certain location and seeing what's going on. <clears throat> As I uh, got involved more and more with, uh, in the profession, I hired other investigators as well to work for me. And that was a big asset. So I could utilize their services as well. But that uh, turned out to be uh, an expensive proposition, but it was well worth it. Because again, I could spread myself out a lot more and have more people involved in doing the research work as well. And they would be trained by me and do it my way. And I always felt that the way I learn is the way I train them. And we would get results and we would get satisfied clients. And that's the uh, most important thing of all is to satisfy a client. Because when a client comes to you with a problem, whether it be uh, domestic, civil, or criminal, they're in distress, they're in problems, they need a lot of help. And you've got to be able to help them. And you've got to use all your knowledge that you've gained throughout your time to give them the information they're going to need. And that is the correct information. You cannot use any type of information that someone told you hearsay. It has to be facts, things you know for sure, what the truth is. And that would be by your agents that seen what actually happened and reported it back to you. And then you could document it. Because you never know when you have to go to court and testify. And <clears throat> my motto is, Always tell the truth. 
Because when you go to court and you tell the truth, it never, never, never changes. But if you start making up stories, the change, it will change. And the minute they catch you, your testimony is thrown out. It's no good. So we always told the truth, and I never allowed for any speculation. It had to be absolute what they seen, what they picked up, what information, what evidence they had. I had to see it. And that's pretty much how we did that part of it. Now we can go on in the future with some other types of investigations. But for now, I think that uh, this should be sufficient, and we will continue at a later date. Everybody have a good day.